Hi everyone. Um, what I might uh, do here, given that you're a Python group, and I'll try and enjoy doing it, I'll open up uh, my Excel and pitch and uh, my product. Um, but I'll talk about some of the um, theoretical aspects of um, binding Python to a high fidelity reading system and how you do it properly and so on, um, and what that means if you're a Python user and uh, why we did that and what that means for us as a product. Um, but to do that, it's probably worthwhile getting a quick bit of background. Um, and I'll try and whip through that as quick as possible. And look, I'd encourage, um, I'd like to be fairly informal, so if you have any pitching or questions or anything, go along, as long as we can keep them fairly short, and then we'll have a longer question period at the end. Um, we'll see how we go. Um, firstly, um, I'll just give you a very, very brief rundown on um, uh, my company, because that'll give you just a bit of a feel of what we're about, what we've done in the past, and why we're interested in Python. Um, so I'll just, I've got a slideshow here, but I'll go through it really very quickly. Um, the key point is that um, we've been in the 3D visualization simulation business for about five or six years, particularly aiming at uh, government, major developers, like real world stuff. Um, and we have an existing, um, Bob and myself, um, and we have a team of 3D artists and software engineers and so on, and another um, 10 or 15 professional 3D artists um, in various locations around the world. Um, and basically what we are about is um, uh, probably starting about 94, uh, I've been interested in games and 3D simulation for a long time, uh, and probably about 94, even then, you could look at a humble 3D graphics card in a PC and it had, even then, more transistors than an entire computer. And by now, they're up to about 10 times as many um, components and transistors as an entire computer. So there's way more power in a graphics card than there is in, in the entire computer put together. And that's been the case for uh, nearly 10 uh, or even more years. And it's also been the case that the very best uh, 3D graphics and rendering, such as you see in uh, high-end video games, that's been way ahead of anything that's been in business for all that time. And that's why there is a big gulf between the kind of um, 3D graphics you see in a very good uh, video game and the kind of graphics you see in the wider business. And that's partly because um, it's very difficult to, um, to work at that kind of level of graphics and uh, so on. So our vision has been to, I guess, um, take that level of um, graphics capability and make that available to business. And not only make it available to business, but to people who have no understanding or knowledge of 3D. So that's fundamentally what we've been about. And MyCosm is our, our new product that we've been working on for about the last three years. Um, it's about to be released, so that's what we'll talk about um, uh, this evening. Uh, but just to give you a bit of background, we had a previous um, product that we're currently using at the moment, a thing called Suburban. That's this thing. And I'm just showing you this very briefly because that just shows you where we've come from. That's a, again, 3D simulation for urban planning. So that, that's used for vertical mar market application used by, I think, 50% of the city councils use this software for um, uh, assessing development applications and visualizing their CBD districts and architectural purposes and urban planning purposes and so on. And so this is the sort of stuff, as you can see here, um, like the top one, I think, is a model of um, Ian Porto uh, that we did. Um, not only in 3D, which that's about as much as you can do that. Not only in uh, 3D, but in accurate 3D. And so our old product, Suburban, uh, we could, uh, in fact, we've done a model of Sydney, 100 square kilometres of every building in Sydney in CBD, accurately put. Uh, whereas uh, the game engines, for example, uh, might make a good looking game but being able to get it accurate to foot and then being able to stand up in court and prove it is another thing entirely. And there are technical reasons why they can't do it. Because game engines don't use the same kind of rendering techniques. And they don't need to. I mean, that's not a criticism. They're about creating an artificial world where they say it's a compelling user experience, completely packaged. Uh, what happens to you is what happens to you. You can't vary that. Whereas our older product is uh, actually um, uh, real world simulation. Now, what my cousin, um, and I'll talk about that, uh, for the last three years we've been building a more open solution than our older product, Suburban, was. And what my cousin is, is a, a 
simulation platform. So the Mono Vertis and Marco application for the family and in particular is an open platform to allow non 3D and non game type people, basically people like yourselves, I presume business uh, owners that are doing these types of programs, to build rich 3D environments, um, particularly with a simulation aspect where you might be simulating something or a model of something. It's rich 3D environments of about the same quality as the best video games in the world at the moment. And we feel there's a big business opportunity there because um, the best video game engines in the world at the moment, most video games you see are actually done on about six um, major video engines and their license fees are typically one, two, three million, four million dollars. Um, so if we here, let's say we wanted to make a game, a typical like the high end, who plays video games in here? Um, like Crisis for example, um, the Crisis engine, two million dollars. So if we wanted to make a game using the Crisis Engine, first thing we do, we go and contact our investor cap venture capitalists and borrow 50 mil, because that's what we'd need uh, to make the game. Then we sit down for three years, we, we give two million to Crisis to license their engine, and we sit down for three years with 100 developers, sometimes 200, uh, to build a game. So this is where your 50 million dollars go. And it's that business channel arrangement that really makes the big gulf between the high-end video game engine and the rest of the business. It's, it's a, a completely walled off type of market. And uh, what we're hoping to do at Micro Gym is give you roughly that same or very close to that same quality, if you like, but at an affordable price. And we can give you something like quite unpleasant. So consumer level price, a million dollar game engine, and also at ease, ease of use, um, you don't have to be a 3D developer. Now, that long-winded roundabout way of saying uh, this is where Python became very important to us and um, because um, all the, there's no game on earth, is there, Python? Basically, it's too slow. Um, all the video games that you, that you sit there and play around and see are C++ um, because um, Python runs for roughly 100 times slower than C++, raw number crunching when you do the remote work and interpret. So it's not designed to um, be high-end rendered. I mean, a typical frame rate of a modern video game is 100 frames a second. So at 100 frames a second, you know, it's calculating thousands of things on objects anywhere in the world, AI, or rendering, and the whole thing. So it just, Python just can't handle that for us. It's not a, uh, there's no video game engine in the world that runs C Sharp either, for the same reason, or Java. They're just too slow. So that's why all the high-end renderings written in C++, then, unless you're a hardcore C++ programmer and you know about 3D, just forget it. So um, the, uh, the games guys are also now beginning to venture out into business. They're attempting to. Um, Crytek, um, for example, uh, you can license their engine if you want to build a business application. So you pay them two million bucks. Uh, then when you find you can't do a terrain bigger than four kilometers, that's it. You can only do four kilometers. Oh, it's because the crisis was an engine designed to build a game on an island. So it doesn't have to do more than four kilometers across. So you might be a business interested in modeling 50 square kilometers. So you go back to Cry Crytek um, company and say, uh, can we modify this so we can do more than that? They can get another $2 million for it. So that's um, the serious game movement uh, from them. So what we needed to do with Microgym, coming on to Python, uh, firstly, we had to build a high fidelity rendering engine for it that's equal to what the top video games do. But then to hand it over to people like you guys who are doing this as a business, we had to have a programming language that was more acceptable than C++. And uh, even though I'm a C++ um, software engineer, 30 years standing, I think it's a terrible language for business use. Um, there's an old saying, I see it was one of the guys before, when I started programming Pascal was the language we got trained in. There was an old saying, with Pascal you can shoot yourself in the foot, with C you can shoot yourself anywhere you damn well like. Um, it's a brutal language. And that's why the more modern languages like Java, Python, and now uh, more recently Ruby and the rest, the newer languages have appeared to get rid of that um, really very difficult aspect of um, the C lang uh, uh, based languages. But it's got the performance, and that's why all the top video games are written in C. So what we've tried to do with Microgym is to join the two together. High, high end rendering engine, but and we've used Python as the programming language. Uh, now, we chose uh, Python, I guess, for a few reasons. One was that uh, Python is very widespread and it's a, it's a, 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 
AI audience um, and, and use general purpose uh, uh, programming. And it's quite easy to use. Um, now, I had not um, touched a line of Python uh, before about nine months ago when I was in about a year of writing the first book in Python. I knew of it, of course, but hadn't worked with it on a laptop. But then the, the, the problem was, how do we join Python with a high-end rendering engine that's written in C++? How do we bring them two together? And um, the games guys, for example, like uh, Crisis and uh, Half-Life and all the other major video game engines, uh, they often use uh, scripting languages, like Lua, which has now really become very popular. Uh, and typically what they'll do, the game level developers will uh, write the higher level AI in a, in a language like Lua. But Lua, you cannot create new types. Uh, there, there's no real notion of types there. It's really just designed for uh, hardcore game developers who write um, uh, uh, high-level logic. Uh, whereas uh, Python, of course, um, is a much broader term. So what we wanted to do with uh, a Python, um, I'm not sure how. Have any of you, um, any of you guys, um, uh, connected Python with C++? Just wanted to give you a bit of background. I'll show you because our theoretical problem is how do we tie Python to our rendering engine, and how do we allow a non-3D person to build a rich 3D environment with no other children? You see, you can't do that with any of the game engines that are on the market today. They require you to be firstly a game developer, and secondly, pretty much to be a C++ or an ASP.NET sort of programmer. So what I'll do just to give you a, a flavour of what my problem is, I might just run. Um, we have a sales and marketing engine here. It's only about three months long, so that but it's a shameless proof to sell the product. So I'm not trying to sell you the product, but I'm just want to show it to you because it does give you a bit of a, uh, a good overview. Um, so I'll just run that now. I don't know what sound we've got here. Um, I might just have to rely on the speakers on the green table. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Green table. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Now, I probably should have put the 
Just use the speakers. Is that someone? Oh, it is. Okay. We'll uh, fall back to um, the agricultural method. We'll point the uh, microphone at it. So, as I say, I'll just run this. It's a, it's a, um, just a brief overview of MyCos and the product. Uh, and it does mention Python as it goes through, but it will just give you a reasonable overview and then we'll actually show it to you running, I guess. Um, And it's a brand new style of virtual environment that? platform. A studio and player that feel as good to use as they look. High end game engine rendering, the physics, and scripting together in a package that lets a broad range of developers produce and publish rich 3D environments. Because my cause and environments are constructed with XML, interoperability with external data sources is as powerful as it is pains. Construct a city from GIS data, track an object with GPS. Make a 3D environment that interfaces with Twitter. Micos Studio has powerful tools that are familiar to experienced 3D artists and easy to get into for casual users. Brush-based sculpting and painting with fine control over meshing and texture layering gives artists the ability to make amazing landscapes. Object manipulation and scene building in Mycosm combines the best parts of high-end 3D modeling software and first-person level editors. Speedtree enables great looking flora to be placed throughout an environment with minimal performance impact. Fully integrated with the lighting and shadow rendering, animated trees can be used just like any other scene asset. Max can be drag and dropped into the Mycosm Asset Manager. From here, they can be tagged and organized, shared with other collaborators, or dropped straight into the 3D environment. uses the powerful NVIDIA physics engine combined with a set of great built-in tools to let you drag and drop physics objects straight from 3ds Max. Use gizmos to accurately place and rotate, or just pick things up and move them around like you're holding them. Mycosm uses its own proprietary rendering engine letting developers create with high-end graphics at an affordable, consumer-level price. Particle systems can be used in environmental effects or attached to objects with scripted behavior. Particle system files in Fork Particle Studio can be drag and dropped straight into the scene. Python script gives you control over every aspect of the environment. Players, physics objects, lights, particle effects, and anything else you can think of can be scripted to react to inputs and events. A script in Mycosm lets you control the entire creation of the environment, as well as the behavior within it. Environments created with Mycosm Studio are published to single files that can be run in Mycosm Player, so experiencing them is as simple as dropping a movie onto your favorite media player. More and 
Download MyCosm Studio and Player at MyCosm.com. So that's um, any questions so far? I think probably just jump in if anyone has questions. That's the easiest way to do this. So um, basically, as you saw, the the idea with Microsoft is a fairly clean interface. It's a design studio to let you build uh, a 3D environment uh, without um, detailed 3D um, uh, knowledge. So you just basically bring uh, 3D assets in from the outside, models that you might get off the internet, or models that you make yourself, or um, and this. For example, TurboSquid is a fairly famous model library on the internet with over one million pieces of content uh, of everything from game characters to vehicles to whatever. So you can just import that directly in and then connect it up with Python script to create uh, behavior. Now the importance for us of having Python there is that because it's a full, rich programming language in its own right, um, Game engines up to now have been traditionally uh, used by game developers to make a game. What we want to be able to do is to have a game engine of that quality but accessible to uh, people who are not game developers. And uh, one use case might be, um, say, a domain expert, as we say in software, maybe a traffic analyst or uh, an engineer or a climate modeler or whatever, who's maybe a bit technical and could face teaching himself a bit of a programming language, and this is where Python has proved itself to be um, uh, uh, accessible to um, people, uh, even non-programmers or uh, maybe shaky programmers um, who learned Fortran 20 years ago. But, but a domain expert, such as I just described, could use Microsm to build their model, their mathematical model, in the same environment where they're doing the visualization. So this is our, our thrust, I guess, with Microsm as a business platform. To, uh, to do simulation or anything really that requires some degree of um, 3D uh, visualization. And because, Michael, uh, because Python has a rich set of uh, libraries for um, uh, accessing databases and the internet and all the rest of it, uh, you can therefore tie your uh, 3D environment to your business back end. Uh, you might have information, for example, um, in a database of um, uh, trees and positions um, in a forest. So you read those in and uh, place trees in those locations and so on. Or you might have building footprints in a database if you're a GIS company. You could read those out and actually construct a model on the fly. So that's um, uh, why we've um, embedded Python. If anyone's got any questions, just jump in. Um, Do that, and this is to make our make my cosm of use to serious um, business developers. Uh, to do that, I might quickly just chuck a little environment together. So, whoops. So, um, what you're looking at here, this is uh, my cosm studio. So, this is the design environment, uh, and basically, in this area here is where your 3D world will appear. This area down the bottom is where all your assets, as we call them, all the stuff that you build up, uh, that you store. And you basically, and I'll show you this acting in a moment, in each of these libraries over here, you've got a bunch of um, 
assets of various types, like trees, particle systems, models, and you just go to your file system and just drag them in there um, directly from your file system, and then from there you drag these into the world. And I'll do that in a second. But just in by way of contrast, I don't know if any of you have done this, but if you go to, I recommend having a look at game three over here. Now that's a game engine that's uh, trying to get down to the lower end, like it's only a hundred k uh, rather than a million dollars. So it's one of the new ways of game engines that's cheap. So if you've got a spare hundred thousand dollars, you can go and get a game three ID or something. But it's still a game engine and it has quite good, um, but it's aimed at game developers. What's interesting about Game Trio is that it has a bunch of tutorial videos on their site showing their tools in action, uh, so you can actually run those. And uh, it's interesting to run them because their equivalent of this has five countless toolbars covered in buttons. The whole right hand side is covered in buttons and there's boxes and drop downs and list boxes and combos and you can even uh, turn it and you actually see the gear wheel. It's a very complex tool. Uh, and that's just one of their um, several sort of tools. Most game engines are like that. And um, they're not easy to use because they don't have to be. Because as I mentioned before, those tools are used by a team engine or building a game over a period of three years with 100 developers who learn that tool and they're all highly skilled experts. So they don't need a, an easy to use interface. Whereas with my case, I can actually see it's got a pen uh, user interface and that's been done deliberately to um, allow a non game developer, if you like, um, someone who's um, interested in high frequency motion capture and that's to be able to use our tools to build an environment without getting too bogged down. However, on the other hand, an experienced game developer can still just jump, jump in and do the stuff they need to do. So that said, I'll just quickly um, knock up uh, a little environment here, an empty one. So I've just got... Um, so here's just a little empty 3D environment. I won't go through anything in great detail here. If anyone's interested and wants to look at any aspect, we can do that afterwards. But I'll just quickly um, chuck some stuff in here um, without really going too much into what I'm doing. I'm just going to add maybe a sky. Um, so what I've just done is... Um, Create, put, a, put a sky in here, you can see a blue sunny sky, nothing much happening at the moment. Um, the sun's up there somewhere. Chuck in some um, an ocean. Turn this grid off, just get it out of the way. Um, in the sky I'll um, add some clouds. Here are my various cloud types and these are uh, meteorologically modelled. So some cumulus clouds. Correct height, altitude, uh, and so on. Now, this is what I wanted to briefly talk about, and I can move the sun. I'll just what I'm going to do is just move the, the sun's up there somewhere. I'm just going to move the sun to change the time of day. Let's see the sun? Where is it? Right. Am I right or you're right? <laughs> the point being, as the sun comes down, notice the colour here. And here's the sun. See what the clouds are doing. Near the stars. Now, the point I want to make here is that the game engine, they are all about creating the user experience in a creative world that is worth controlling. So in a game engine, the sky is the effect. It may be rendered up to look this by an artist. Uh, and it can be used with an entirely suite of artists. Like if I had to sit down and paint tonight, the sky wouldn't be able to do it. So that's our game engine. Um, whereas we're aiming at the non-game developer. So we have to allow this to happen uh, without using any artists. Um, so what we've done here, we're thinking about depth, spongy, and something like that. And we're going to use a parallel 3D graphics card to do that. Because um, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but um, a 3D graphics card is actually a high-end numerical simulator uh, and can be engineered to be uh, close to a perfect sequel, if you like, by the games industry. They don't act that way now. Um, and it can actually uh, do stuff that's nothing to do with graphics. So what we're doing here with the sky, um, if you go to the internet and just Google 
Larry Beckham, uh, and Louis Beckham, and the French promoter, asked you to tell us what a star is. And basically what that is, it's a Marine Corps pilot squadron, which given three numbers, calculates the color of one spot. And the three numbers are the angle above the horizon, the angle from the sun, and the what's called turbidity, which is the amount of air in the air, the amount of air in the sky. So we've all had the experience where we look toward the sun, the blue sky toward the sun is quite washed out, 180 degrees away from some of the street blue, and you get this effect up in San Diego. You see that um, uh, kind of orange effect there. Um, excuse me, I can't see the keyboard here. As the sun gets higher up, this area here gets less uh, orangey and more as the sun gets low. The point I'm making is what we've done with my problem is taken that A4 page equation, which calculates the colour of one single spot. So on this screen, you can see about a million pixels that are uh, in that region. So uh, the 3D graphics card can actually be downloaded those kinds of equations and just reproduce. Nothing to do with any calculation. Um, and it calculates simultaneously the colour of every pixel, so a million pixels can simultaneously so that colour is not artistically rendered, it's computed by, by the central scientific model of the sky. And I, in fact, ran that calculation uh, a couple of years ago now on the CPU, so the computer could do the same thing to a scene on the CPU. Of course, the CPU has to compute that one pixel after the other. And that took about five seconds. With this, we run at 100 frames a second, 136 frames a second, um, but it's five seconds, so it's thousands of times faster. So we're not talking about a 100% improvement or a 50% improvement, we're talking about thousands of times faster. And the same can happen with water. Um, I can show you this with the rain, but uh, well actually, when you look through the water, that's what you're seeing, the depth of the water that you're looking through, whether there's silt, uh, and that's what you know, the nice look, same thing, every pixel is the same as every other pixel. So the the purpose of all of that is that my problem is designed so that with no real effort on your part, uh, you get a good looking result because it's a realistic result. It's just running a real equation where you get a good result with no effort. And we do also provide, if you are an artist with an OBI or an artist um, doing some work at the top of your uh, at an art school or an university, you can show them how to solve this problem. On the other hand, if you want to walk up and you want to get into such a problem, you can use a or the, the name of a computer developer or, or a patent or whatever, um, you can argue this is kind of got some more turbidity on it than you've got maybe a small. But you in LA, you can um, find an indoor suit that suits a bit more over your standard of blue green hair. You don't have to go to the university to know how to small. So you can start, as well as looking good, you can start using it to solve real um, engineering problems. <coughs> Physics, as you saw before, you saw Bunny, um, who dropped in. Now that was made where in Los Angeles? That was in Sierra Leone, one of the richest men in the world. So uh, they have made a model which can be put on maps so that the uh, model is happy to be treated as their model is. And the British do their maps and it's full of squirting fishies and stuff. So you can think that we've got one of our models. We build that buggy and then say, and this wheel weighs 50 kilograms. This suspension strut is joined on with a force of so much. So it's actually accurate physics, and then when we import it, it just works. So it's just a big black wheel, wheel break off, and then you trot it away. So again, you can actually do this for fun, or you can do it as a vocation, or you can do it as a job for your own benefit. Um, but you can also do something quite serious and uh, difficult problem solving. Uh, you may not have noticed, but that buggy had a person in front of it. So we have a, what's called? Oh, absolutely. Well, the, the two-way interaction is important. So in Python, you can interact the other way with the client and ask it questions and get feedback and so on. So that buggy is normally a, a lab or a, a basically a model of human beings with feet and feet in it so that you can have joints and knees and so on and uh, lots of fun to be dragged by foot. Look around the office. It's huge fun. But, um, but basically, when you've got that, that buggy, when the guy's dead, the lives of the side of the vehicle basically is in the buggy's hands as well. 
data in a Python mode, C++ star, uh, you would write a Python code in the format that you can hand over to Microsoft and say, now this is a collision with this head, you tell me about it. So the C++ couldn't turn to its normal mode or its normal assignment when the head plows on the side of the, of the buggy that you just put the disk in. Um, your Python is executing and you get passed down the, the force angle and the position of the collision. So then you can say to the mode coordinate engineer, come and get it for us and we'll pass down the extra offset or whatever. So that's the way we try to create the best of both worlds in terms of programming the disk and the Python that it fails to process lightly to let you create a quite different environment and you can um, unhand it over to the game floor and be out for That was why um, that last year the report was run on a accurate sound of modeling, which you don't have to use, but it will um, make it easier to take something good looking and go epic, but you can also use the Python tools. And that's across the board across um, Python Sound and um, C Sound for uh, the Arch Linux. Hasn't been released yet, but uh, okay. I'll just show you. Well, it could be. Uh, that's I think um, if you want to make a game out of it, that's fine. But you can also do something serious, where it's very difficult. It's very difficult to go the other way. That is to take a game engine and then do do a business application in which it's not designed to do that. Um, I'll just show you. Um, We have deployed a website. It's um, I think it's um, wactuality.net.au. Um, I can give you the link if you want to look later. Um, uh, some of you may be aware um, the Australian um, band out of the Shanghai Expos. Um, we have um, or Australia has um, this shape uh, of a wet paved train uh, uh, span so that the water can't get smeared on the computer when you're playing and by using that navigation. So my company Smurf has used the Actuality website to create this piece. So that's a showcase of the actual piece as part of the Australian Indigenous Festival of Shanghai Expo. Uh, so um, what that is is basically a, a bunch of computery 2D um, photographic camera scans done by the Shanghai Photographic Bureau and the Shanghai Location. But there's two locations that can download a Microsoft Smurf. So that's on my page if you'd like to do that. Four gallon drum can of corn and hooked it up to the end of the Australian Smurf and milked the sheep. But we modelled both of those in Microsoft, and the idea is to do a bunch of throwaway things that if you're at the Shanghai Expo, you wouldn't be doing a game out of this, and no one else does a game out of it. And I'll show you those now, or one now, because the point here is to spot niche behaviour in it, typical of what you see in the game, but draw your own prices. Um, so I'll just run, it'll only take a minute, I'll just run that here now. Only, uh, it's multiplayer and only Windows at the moment, but we'll probably do a Mac port and maybe a 360 port, but we're starting off on Windows because that's what we know. So yes, only Windows at the moment. Um, we just run this. Run it. So basically this is what you get if you went to that site and just downloaded it. Um, so our problem here was you're getting somebody completely cold, Chinese, walks past, oh, that looks good, waves at it with their phone, goes home and loads it on, it's only Windows based, um, loads it on their PC, downloads, so they know nothing about it whatsoever. Similar to a game, a lot of modern games now um, arrange themselves, so you pretty much learn as you go through the game, because they know people are just going to download it and run it. So they don't have a separate boot camp level anymore like they used to in the old days, it's, it's in line. Um, teach you as you go. So, and this is very simple, there's nothing much to it because it was just a quick throwaway. But what I, what I wanted to just get you to appreciate is everything you see here is written in Python. So we start off here with a simple splash screen telling you a little bit about uh, Black Mountain Tower. Um, you just hit a key and it fades off. At any later point I can come down here and click the help button. Comes back again, fades off. I can uh, run around, for those of you who play first-person shooters, 
It's um, your typical WSAD thing. I can just run around the observation deck here. You've got a bit of a joke balloon floating past with the actuality logo on it. There was some um, black uh, effort inside the company that I didn't know about. Put me in the basket waving, but uh, thank God they didn't. Um, a few little things, like if I run up to the binoculars here, a little bit of text pops up, press E to use the binoculars, press E. I can zoom in. There's the balloon. Back out. And this, remember, we wanted to restrict what the user could do. It couldn't be complex, so you can just run around this little restricted environment. Uh, to go downstairs, we didn't even want the user to try and navigate that, so as soon as you get close, press E to descend to level one. Do that. It's a hard-coded camera path that glides you down to the next level. And then, if I don't touch anything for a while, I'll just leave it. Uh, it's a usual game type thing that if you don't touch the keyboard for a while, it'll go into a free-flowing demo mode. So in about 30 seconds, it'll just start cruising around. So that's, you know, there's nothing much to it. But um, the, I'll just wait and see if it's going to do that. Is it 30 seconds or a minute, Warren? I can't remember. Um, just do your knitting while we wait. No, we won't worry about that. Um, there's just one other little thing in, um, uh, and by the way, this model here, as you can see, uh, we're not using uh, quite typical game techniques. They'll use a little texture, which is concrete, and then tile it over large areas. You know, they, uh, because it's a made-up environment, uh, because we're modelling something real, this is done from actual photography. So that stain you see there, we went up and actually photographed the tower and uh, used all that real imagery to, to fill the, the real place. Oh, there's the shadow of the balloon going past. Um, so, uh, and also in the real Black Mountain Tower, there's actually, when you walk in the foyer, there's a model of the tower. So just as a bit of a whimsy, we kind of threw that in as well. So here's the, um, the actual model of the tower inside the virtual model of the tower. So it's a bit self-referential, but, uh, but there you go. And that effect you just saw, the, the, that's again done in Python using um, uh, what are called post-processing effects in the rendering business. You can do things like vignettes and blur and uh, increase contrast um, and um, colour saturation. And a lot of the games guys, they, they'll do things, they'll agonise over the exact amount of colour saturation to use. Like Quake, for example, was famous for being very brownish and dark in its toning. And the games guys will actually spend a lot of effort to to get the, the, the look and feel. So we've got those those things in there if you do want to use them. So what our Python script did in that case for the transition, just used the vignette and then in Python, over the next few seconds, just animated it to you know, give you the, the, the Warner's Brothers cartoon shrinking spot effect. So I'll quickly um, show you what the, the mint one, because that's got another interesting aspect to it. Again, very simple. Uh, this is a, a model of um, the Royal Australian Mint. This is the coin mint. The, the note mint is in Perth, but the coin mint's in Canberra. And as I mentioned, they have this whopping big robot, two or three times the height of this uh, room, that picks up 44-gallon drums. So that's a filled with coin blanks. That weighs a ton. So it picks these things up and pours them and so on. So it's a pretty amazing piece of machinery. Um, and here it is here. Uh, and you'll see in a moment as the camera just moves around, you'll see some of the 44-gallon drums so you get an idea of the scale. Um, now, again, same thing. We're starting off um, just with a, a camera gliding around uh, certain parts so you can kind of see what's going on. Uh, if you look, you'll see, oh, there's a 44-gallon drum here. So it's quite a big uh, machine and it moves in multiple axes. At any point, I can just click and take over. And now there's um, a little bit of a user interface here. So if I click, um, say, on uh, that bit of Titan, I can move it in that direction. This is now me moving it by the keyboard or there. Now that's about all it does at the moment. We are going to add more to it so you'll actually be able to pick up some coins and pour them into the chute and maybe even have two robots and fight each other and so on. And um, Interestingly, but the point of showing you this is this little user interface here it was, again, done in Python. 
Uh, we just did those images and created a button um, and so on. So within the Python uh, code, you can create, again, the usual experience, experience a user has of your environment, complete with interacting with it, clicking on menu items, having buttons and so on, exactly as a game uh, person would. And that user interface was done with about half a dozen lines of Python. So we've added those classes uh, to uh, Python so that you can interact with our back end. Um, and the way these things go, uh, and this is why, um, as any developer, you're always looking for ways to improve your capability and what you've got in your, in your tool set. Uh, and often you might be doing some application in some um, uh, domain, and there might be a little kind of side um, usage for 3D that improves it a little bit. And often what I find, you put some 3D in and then the users see it, because many of them uh, don't play games, for example. Um, and when they see 3D, they get all sorts of ideas about what then can be done. This particular one here with the Mint, their original charter to us was, um, they paid us uh, 5,000 bucks, it wasn't much, it was a little throwaway, and we knocked this up within that budget. Um, so their charter to us was just impress people and get their asses into the Mint so they'll give us money, because they have a shop. So it's basic, and they, they know the robot is a big, um, attraction item. They have all the kids lined up. It's in, in the main factory floor. There's a balcony where you can look down, kind of like that view there, glassed off, and they actually have the robot dancing when it's not busy. They have it kind of doing this sort of, because everyone lines up thinking it's terrific. So their, their idea, it's shameless sales and marketing. They, they, they want to get people interested in actually going to the Mint. So basically as a little throwaway, the head guy at the Mint happened to mention that they had high resolution photography of their coin designs. They do about 25 uh, specialty coin designs each year for, for special events. And if I press spacebar, here, here it is uh, here. So this is one of their uh, coin designs. Now if you look carefully, one of the techniques in graphics uh, is a thing called bump mapping. And basically it lets you show them look carefully, it is actually physically there because the shadows um, actually react to it. So you can see those indentations there if you look closely, the, the, the grooves, uh, the lighting is changing on those grooves. So there's, there's 3D there, but there are no signs in there. So all there is is a photograph of inside one of the bricks and the graphics card is full. Um, so this took our artist about 10 minutes to just make what are We did that just as a little extra for the Mint. They have it in some of the areas fairly poor in this world. It didn't do much. The Mint saw it and they went down one of payments with five or $6,000 per coin, 25 coins per year, to actually distribute this design amongst their other offerings. Because they already spent $2,000 just in getting that photograph of the Mint. To get some high end professional photographers come in, do the macro lens and get a good special event that cost them $2,000 so uh, that was a case where we did this just as a pure lark. They saw it and saw something else entirely. And that's often what happens when you make new technology available for business. Uh, and that's often more exciting than anything being done in 3D. It usually starts off in the game arena uh, or entertainment, and that's all for well and good. But it tends to seep out over time into a broader business uh, business and start to see the advantage of things that can be done with coin in 3D and in animation and animation. So. That's, um, that's our whole purpose in my talk. Is there any, any questions? Uh, DirectX at the moment is actually a little bit of just uh, open to the internet and just trying to work out the price, in fact. Uh, but uh, quite frankly, uh, initially for the initial market, we want to launch a uh, fairly minimal mini game. There are even companies that are actually looking to support the, the airport for you if you want to launch the game yourself. But we don't think that's the best way to do it. So our intent is to have a launch of certainly a mini platform uh, and maybe some relatively low-budget experimental games. And that's uh, the best case. We're looking at certain early stages. 
Oh, it's way beyond that. Yeah, okay. Uh, not really. What I, what I was sorry, Ben. Yeah, I was going to say uh, that six uh, point seven nine is not. But but that's a um, uh, a novel, a new tone in graphics. It's nothing to do with most of the comics that I've been playing around with before. I can't get much of a star out of these characters in terms of uh, that novel. And uh, basically, that done on the CPU, which is an entire size of the star, and then it gets you know, compressed in memory. Just straight Newtonian gravity equations is one of them, so you can do a mix. Exactly, so you're running. Oh no, you're just running on a GPU. You can actually. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Good question. Uh, not yet, and no one in, in the world has done one yet. In fact, they're in print. Yeah. Um, but they're called shaders. Um, but the thing you write on top of the GPU. Um, and at the moment, it's written in a separate language, which is the uh, Pilot Shader language, which is the, the um, um, GPU. It's written in a separate language, and you can write out the architecture for the GPU and so on. It's reasonably hard, uh, which is why you don't see much in the way of progress yet out of that language. And the top data processes in the world are going by stuff like Array. Uh, they go from one game to some of the other. And this, um, and this sort of thing. Yeah, because it takes a while to yeah, do the Pilot programming. Because that's what makes one game big and epic and it's got more effects than it is of that in other uh, such exciting data uh, versions. And of course, business savings can be used to try to fuel innovation. And interestingly, in the Western world, they haven't done that. There's one shader in a ton of GPU technology, and many people are using it separately. So, uh, and in fact, one of the new ones that's been introduced has got nothing to do with any of the stuff we have before, like compute shader. That's purely there to do computation. It's nothing to do with anything. So that's recognition by Microsoft and NVIDIA. That's the way things are going. They're, they're moving more and more general purpose stuff away from going into the GPU. Um, one of the examples uh, uh, that I think of, and I don't know the business, but um, it actually has two tank guns, uh, which are running on the SX-11 Alarga Super. That's the reason to do that. Uh, I don't know if it's useful for using the Python stuff to do that. But two tank guns and a model of a trial um, stand or something like that. And these two tank guns in combination fire this huge rocket at 40 rocket loads of lead paint in all directions. And 20 bucks goes to a glue plant somewhere in Africa. And as they hit this guy, uh, the rocket just moves around and this thing does its own kind of thing and goes around spraying millions of separate particles uh, of, of the fluid. So it's a first time with these new shaders you can do it at the uh, top size of the fluid and run all three kinds of uh, fluids on the GPU and it's used in experiments and any kind of fluid motion that you can have a computer um, so water for example is a good option uh, to have that in play so again uh, Go to Toyota, they say, No, no, you go to Sperm, you have six hundred years of experience now. Uh, the method of construction is the same, not so even not alike. Yes, you can see through it. But certainly in the only way you ever think of trying to get that same problem is to get a CPU part for it. First thing is to get a battery part for it, then the order of the engineers is the same, whether it's a prototype or whether it's a test run or whatever. Um, the air of military simulation, uh, I was talking about this a little while back, which is a way of getting out of uh, the construction of the new world. But uh, it's a military simulation of one that you can throw an aircraft in. Now that has a ton of international planes, uh, so that's fine, but then you turn the clock on it so that it doesn't even go that much like that. It goes <coughs> and does 20 rounds a second. In fact, every round is $400. And you multiply that up, that's $8,000 by the gun. And uh, so it exceeds the cost of it to throw an enemy aircraft in there. So it's a huge user in defense at the moment. In the army, but in the navy, they do all their training on two-story buses. Yeah. And so 
they say that was my bad man, I used to forget it. And I'd be all flattered to see them up there and it's lovely and how they do it and it's amazing to see them up there. And the memory of that was the drive and all the rest of it. And I see you and I explain that this is the only way you can die and you'll live forever. And even for me, for maybe you would go and say, I'm just glad you think so because I don't want to suffer the consequences. But I hate the consequences. One voice in I get the money and I can grow in it and there's something that I wind up paying and paying and I get very upset with it. Why would they put it on me when I can keep living for as long as I want? Even though, so I'm not criticizing them, I just don't like it. They're all in a different class of suffering. They do what they do very well and they live very nice and happy doing it. They're, they're just not set up and they're not interested in my life and my future. Yeah, well, it's just, uh, well, certainly for the physics side, and the physics man is really good at giving the physics side of it. Um, but as a natural person, I'm very interested in the abstraction side of things, and I think that's part of the problem. Um, but for the physics side, I'm not talking to you about that, because I think both have to be true in one sense. And I don't think that that's what it means for me to know my brother and sister in Christ, and for them to know that they're just like us, and that they're just like us, and that they're just like back to the years that we all met Dad and I were like, okay, I'm back to Dad. Look at that and it's different to me now than it was back then. But on that point, uh, I know that even for my case, for me and us as well, I try to keep in my own head that this is all that I have. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm not very engaging or that I don't stay in my job or that I don't go out and have a look around and have a look at home. I give you one example of that. I'm a very engaging person. There was a little piece of paper that I used to have in my car that used to sit in the bottom of the drawer of my Sleep and nothing seemed to happen. And all it was was a, a little ragdoll character standing on top of a piece of paper that I used to have in my car. Don't even know what I looked like. It was a little kind of nondescript strip that came out of the side of the drawer. But when I reached out to hand it, I went, <laughs> down the steps I went, or even down the back of the window, down the window that way. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. It was like something as trivial as that. And the reason physics is very important to Darren is that it increases without any effort. So in normal games, it's all physical now. If I had a character running along and then I got behind that character, I would have to flip it over and write myself an animation of a character so that I could say, I believe you're going to make that thing so and so. Whereas with physics, I can say, I want to make that character look just like the character and start walking like that. And then start bowling ball with it. Bowling ball would hit me wrong and I know my character would get hurt. And then I could pretend to have done the thing that in my own head. So if you then drop the piano on your head, um, it would crumple in the right way without you doing anything. So you can create much nicer gameplay and behaviour. But on the serious side of things, I would just say that the opportunity out there in this world modern uh, in the simulation world, because it's real physics, um, it's living planets, uh, as you say, you can spend a year just going through all these physical things, but certainly within a planet you can have a lot of different planets that you control the way. And if we can hand that capability over to uh, the average programmer of and even if you're not a Python person, and this comes to uh, the way the Scottish Dylan might do it, um, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, the Dylan, um, we, we chose Python programming languages quite a while ago because it was basically the most fun and the most nice and dynamic and interesting and exciting thing to have to do with it. And since it came along, we now have things like the Dylan Scott, but uh, we just found it interesting to use the Dylan language open, uh, in particular with Sam and I and Mark Bassett um, and we're on Google Maps and we're on uh, the Dylan app and we're on Mark as well so that we can have things like that with the Dylan app and we can just say I want to have text on it and then it just puts it into the web page and then drops the text in front of Python and it tells us what to do and if we want to go out and follow the bunny and do it that way then we can just click on that button and it takes us to the page and it's like okay go do it um, and we got Dylan In fact, I was pretty wrong when I said that there's many things that you say in the Dylan app. So, in fact, I am able to go to any service that you offer and I can just click on it and it tells me what to do. So, that's a proven track record for us. We won't have to think of any programming language that we can say, well, we won't just say there's a Python app. So, it'll come along and then you click on Python and it'll say, you know, you want to go and you want to download the latest patch from the GitHub repository. And this is all on the Facebook page. So, 
Please, please do it. 